Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today we're going to be looking at another Celestial Storm deck. This time it's going to be combining one of the coolest cards of the set, a reprint of Bayonet, now updated in a GX form, alongside Zoroark, the most likely partner for this card. I know a lot of people are hyped about this archetype and it's a pretty interesting one that I've just started to play around with, uh, so I do have a few opinions on this deck overall. So let's start off with the basic concept. Zoroark, he's a tier 1 boy. Drawing cards is insane and he's been the benchmark for a lot of different archetypes being built and successful because when you can draw cards anything's possible. You can make some crazy turns happen with things like Puzzle of Time for example and some cool one-offs that you can insert into the deck. Baynet can provide one of those really crucial things which is good type coverage for Zoroark for dealing with Boswell Lycanroc. Boswell Lycanroc, of course, being one of the menaces of Zoroark, one of the big headaches. Uh, many people say that it's, you know, at most a 50-50 matchup for the Zoroark player. Uh, there'll be debates on that, and I'm not, I'm not going to get into it, but undoubtedly Baynet can help this because you do have Fighting Resistance, 200, oh, sorry, 190 base hit, hit points with that resistance on top of that. And you're a psychic type that can attack for one energy. So it fits the bill of a nice stage one uh, that already inserts nicely into Zoroark. Because we've seen this shell function before with things like Golisopod GX that works off of one energy, caps at around 120, and uh, is just one attachment. Bennett is a very similar, similar card. Its attack costs are just one psychic, and it can provide this help in terms of uh, type coverage, which is huge. And finally, Bennett's ability also is very helpful. If you're not against the fighting decks, or even if you are against the fighting decks, this ability is going to fix math throughout games to reach one-hit KOs. I've actually been testing a lot with Shrine of uh, Punishment, that new stadium, and I've seen how important that these one damage counter things can do. And when you're using Bayonet's ability, you're basically doing the same thing. For example, putting one counter two times on a Tapu Lele now means that Zoroark can one-hit KO it with a Choice Band, doing Riotous Beating. Similarly, Bayonet itself can one-hit KO a Lele after throwing just one damage counter towards it. So uh, the pseudo heal is really going to be helpful for you, but putting one or two damage counters across the board can really help math fix. And I think that's the thing that's being undersold at the moment with Bayonet's ability. Uh, Zoroark is so good at getting hit and soaking up this damage that if you're using things like Guzmas, your Bayonet has a float stone. Even if, even if you're not attacking with it that turn, you're just getting that one extra ping before using uh, a healing card like a max potion so it could be really really good for you just to set up this math throughout a game and win conditions can arise just by having this ability proc you know a few times in a game so very very powerful card in my opinion so let's get into the list we're going to be playing a 4-4 line of Zoroark it's a Zoro deck three Tapu Lele as well fitting the shell very neatly we're gonna play a 2-2 line of Bayonet uh, I'm using the 60 hit point um, shop it I think it's better than the Confusion Shop It, just because HP is usually the best thing to go for. Um, I can't think of a huge amount of specifics where 50 and 60 are different specifically for Psychic Pokemon that are weak to Dark. Uh, but I think the general baseline is that you just want more hit points in general, because you'll die to less random stuff. Then we have two Bayonet GX. As I mentioned, 190 hit point Psychic type with that Fighting Resist makes it bulky and annoying and we've seen how often Zorart decks have had to play not just one Mew EX but oftentimes two is the count that people are going for at the moment so this is a far safer upgrade to that as an answer to the fighting decks because when you're playing that Mew EX you're basically hoping that they can't respond KO the Mew otherwise you're going to continue to fall behind so the Bayonet is very very good in terms of its tank ability as well as its efficiency. Shady move is this ability. Once during your turn, if this Pokemon is your active, you may move one damage counter from either player's Pokemon to another Pokemon. So even if you've done some splash damage, which we don't actually have the option to do in this deck, um, but even if you've just done like an energy drive poke in the early turns, you can move those one or two damage counters around uh, to make it more beneficial for you later on. So it's really important to note that it can even be damage already on your opponent's side of the field, which is good because Zoroark's a two-hit KO deck in general and saving... A damage counter here and there can be really nice but ideally you're moving one off your own dude to throw that counter onto your opponent's side of the board whenever this guy's active so as i mentioned floatstone is amazing for this card just to get these initial like little bits of value throughout a game really is what we're looking to get here it then has two attacks both for the psychic cost shadow chant does 30 
and does 10 more for each supporter card in your discard pile. You can't add more than 100 damage in this way. So Shadow, Shadow Chant caps at 130 damage if there are 10 supporters in your discard pile. Uh, and you can choice ban to 160. And this is where I can mention that the Shady move is excellent, especially for Lele's and other 170 HP EXs and GXs. So do bear that in mind. And it also offers an amazing GX attack for you. Tomb Hunter GX puts three cards from your discard pile into your hand. Again, for that one psychic cost, it's the exact same as Decidueye, but almost better because Decidueye oftentimes had to find itself like a DCE to then attack the not the next turn with, the, with uh, itself. And here we are the complete package. So in a defensive manner, we can use an N and then Tomb Hunter our way to guarantee a win condition for next turn, which is very easy with Zoroark because you're getting back puzzles essentially. Um, but at the same time, you can already retreat out of your Bayonet and you can already attack with a Bayonet itself and it stays active for its ability to proc again. So uh, it's really going to be neat using this GX attack in the late game alongside an N, or even if you're ahead in the game, you can just go for that Tomb Hunter GX attack anyway to recover resources in general because uh, you're getting back three puzzles. These are oftentimes a Zoroark player's win condition. We've seen how important Oranguru can be in lists. And this GX attack is a one-time use, but it's immediately to the hand. So it's much more aggressive in that aspect compared to Oranguru. So very, very good GX attack as well. And alongside Tapicure, these are the two GX attacks that we have the option to use here. Onto the one-offs, I'm still playing a Guru because even though you have Tomb Hunter to get three cards back from your discard pile, I don't think you'll be able to compete with uh, more stally Zoro builds. And I think it's safer for you to play the Guru overall. It also means that you pretty much auto win Mill, which is great as well. Uh, and you're not just stalled out by like Hooper and stuff like that. So Oranguru, just a load off Zoro players' minds. After playing it in uh, a special event just a few weeks ago, I would definitely play it in future. It just makes sense. Good for Mirror. You don't lose to Mill, which is a deck you always hate to lose against. Uh, and you don't lose to a one-off Hooper in people's decks. So thumbs up for me. Guru's a mainstay in Zoro going forward. A couple more cards that I think are becoming more and more necessary as we start to see the Celestial Storm meta start to develop. Uh, Mr. Mime and Sylveon EX. Mime, of course, very good for these sort of new spread type archetypes coming out of the ashes with that Shrine of Punishment Stadium, which, by the way, is as good as it looks. Uh, it's a very good stadium. So meaning having this Mr. Mime in play just means that you're not going to get completely run over by these sort of devolve or spread lele approaches, stuff like that. So the Mime is very cool for that aspect. Also helps you out against uh, New Age Necrozma. Malamar builds because they can go for black rate into the psychic Lele for game. Uh, so the Mr. Mime is going to complete Stonewall that, which is good to know. And the Sylveon X in here with that dress up attack for a DCE does 30 plus 30 more if you have a tool attached. So the idea is to put a choice band on and then you're one shotting Rayquaza GXs. So an archetype which is otherwise very difficult for us because it just goes for one hit KOs, which we can't really deal with too well as a Zoroark player. Sylveon now with puzzles and um, just itself in general, as soon as you start depleting the Rayquaza of energy, they become a, a lot less threatening of a deck. So the Sylveon going to help out that Rayquaza matchup. So overall 18 Pokemon, uh, I think it covers a lot of bases with these 18 here. Onto the trainers, it's a little bit skimpy for a Zoroark deck and that's the main concern looking at this archetype. We don't have cool stuff like Max Potion, we don't have... Um, a few other one-offs like Rescue Stretcher, which would be really nice that you sometimes see in these Zoro builds. But that's because we need to play more supporter cards to support the Bayonet. So right now, we're just playing the one Mysterious Treasure. I'm choosing to play this over something like an Evo Soda, which is sometimes seen in Zoro builds. Uh, because Treasure can grab you a Lele for Bridget, and it can also grab you your Bayonet pieces. You can choose to play a, um, a Evo Soda over the Treasure. But at the moment, we're playing three Bridget, so the fourth... Uh, or the one treasure acts as a fourth Bridget to give you very good odds of having turn one Bridget. So bear that in mind. Treasure's currently in here. Slightly more value than in previous lists. So good to know that. Two copies of E-Hammer. I think we still need to play these. Um, we're very worried about uh, Lycan Rock still um, because we're not playing, obviously, green stuff. We can't one hit KO. Uh, Lycan Rock's in response to so the way that they carry themselves and run away with the game is if they can get this Lycan Rock set up, taking four prizes. Uh, so trying to E-hammer them away makes it very nice, and especially against like Zoro Rock mirrors and stuff like that, never allowing them to have an energy on the board uh, means that they can't do multi-switch plays and stuff like that. So 
more of a Zora Rock card than a necessary Buzz Rock card, but it's still very helpful indeed for dealing with uh, Lycan Rock, which is the biggest fear for this deck, really. If that gets to attack twice and, you're, and you haven't dealt with it by then, you pretty much lost the game. Two copies of Blower, obviously Zora Garb doing well at the NAIC. You're going to need to have at least two copies, potentially three, going into Worlds because Zora Garb probably going to be on a lot more people's radars now. It doesn't really lose anything and still looks pretty potent because uh, there are a few new ability archetypes coming out from the set. And it's Zoro, so it'll do well no matter what. But at the moment, we're sticking with two blower, uh, just for space reasons. Again, you want to have as few, or you want to have as many spaces dedicated to support as possible because it gets your bane up, up and running quicker. So that just makes sense, really. Four copies of Ultra Ball, four copies of Puzzle, all very self-explanatory. Two copies of Choice Band. It's very good with the bayonet, especially on Lele's. Uh, very good with Zoroark attacking for Lele's as well. So Choice Band math just way better now because we're not just the two hit KO deck always now we're trying to get these creative pings uh moving them around the board so that then we can reach one hit KOs later on so two copies of choice fan there and two copies of floatstone again a lot more decks are moving towards two float like a lot of zorowaks have tried to as much as possible it just again makes sense on Bennett. it's amazing to have the free damage pinging around the board throughout the game it will pay off for you so i'm happier with two count than the one count and finally, one parallel city. Uh, it's really good for establishing your guru in mirror matches so that it doesn't get KO'd sometimes. Uh, it's very good for limiting bench in general, again, in mirror matches in a lot of situations, to be honest. Really good for Malamar, really good for even things like Buzz Rocket is good against uh, just to get rid of their stadium in the first instance, but also it stops them getting like second artillery out and stuff like that. So uh, parallel, very good card in general. We all know why this card's insane. Uh, on supporters, we're playing 17, so it's very high for Zoroark decks. Typically, you're looking around 14 uh, for Zoro builds. We're going the whole hog with 17. We're going to play one copy of Delinquent. Uh, again, this is nice um, for just trying to ruin people's hands. This is a great way to catch Buzzrock players off guard. We've seen it with the sort of Tord build that did well at the NAIC, got second. Uh, just getting people's hands to zero. Uh, the Zoro lock archetype, I guess you'd call it. Um, you can just catch players off guard with this delinquent play. Also very good for Malamar. Good for pretty much everything non-Zoroark. And even against Zoroark, it can give you an edge. Even if you're both playing a Ranguru, if you're the one playing delinquent, you can thin their hand more than uh, more than they do to you. So the delinquent's a really big bonus for you. I actually don't think we're that unfavoured in Zoro mirror matches as long as you just dump your Bennett line, essentially. Or you use your Bennett for your final prizes on Lele because you can... Put the Bayonet down from a shop it, which isn't a threat really. You go into Bayonet, you use its ability once, then you choice band attack and finish off the game. So Bayonet is less of a liability than you'd think. And because we're playing this delinquent in here and to a Cirola, we may actually be okay in mirrors, surprisingly enough. So do bear that in mind. One copy of Sycamore. I'm normally very against Sycamore in um in Zoro decks, but we need to get supporters in the discard pile as quickly as possible. You really want four supporters in the discard pile by turn two if you're up against buzz rocks because then the bayonet is dealing with baby buzzes um and sycamore helps us do that and on top of that we have the tomb gx or whatever it's called um to recover more cards alongside guru as well so i think because we have that little bit more uh recovery in addition to the fact that we want to be fast we have to be fast with supporters and just dump them as quickly as possible sycamore makes sense one copy of Mallow, great for Zoro decks. Two copies of Acerola, uh, choosing to play two copies instead of one and one Max Potion, which I'm normally preferable to, um, just because we want to have more supporter cards. Two Cynthia, three N, three Bridget, four Guzma. I think four Guzma is the highest count possible. Again, things like Counter Catcher have been played, but we want to have more supporter cards physically, which also means, again, in Mirrors, we're aggressive. We can deal with Zerua after Zerua after Zerua if they're slowly evolving, and that also gives us an edge in some aspects um compared to things like counter catcher and uh the three bridget three and two cynthia is pretty staple in zoroark throughout so that's not doesn't need much uh discussion really you could play that fourth bridget um to bump you up to 18 you can just cut that mysterious treasure if you really want to uh, but it's all about balance really it's up to you if you want to do that the mysterious treasure is sort of a pseudo discard of a supporter because it can also be a card that physically discards itself so uh, that's the intention why we're just sticking with free Bridget, even though this support account could be even higher, theoretically. Finally, onto the energy, seven. Uh, four DCE and three Psychic. No real surprises here. Uh, if you want to be super cheeky, I wouldn't hate going to two Psychic Energies. 
Uh, with the theory being that you're probably going to have to Sycamore on the turn that you want to attack with Bayonet if it's turn two against Buzzrocks, because you have to get enough support in the discard for it to be worthwhile. Uh, but at the same time, if you're using Sycamore, sorry, if you're using Sycamore, you're not using Mallow, so you don't guarantee yourself to hit those two Psych Energies. So I think three is just the safest count. I think it's going to be really reasonable. We have that Tappy Cure available as well for more Zoro Mirrors. So I actually think because we are playing the Bayonet stuff, don't be frightened about Zoro Mirror, but. Uh, we may actually have more tools than other Zoroite decks to win the game, to be honest. So um, I think it's really, really reasonable. And three Psych Energy, kind of on the higher side, but it's also just what we're used to. And we're sticking to a traditional Zor uh, Zoroark shell as much as possible. So here's the list in full. Uh, pause now if you want to take the screenshot or do whatever you want to do. It will also be in the, the uh, description as always. But now we'll look at some uh, tech options. There's actually a lot I thought about with this deck because... Um, it's a deck that I'm really focusing on because Zoroark's obviously a deck that I've been playing all season for the most success. Um, and it's always one that I'd like to play around with. And this list itself is very creative in its own right because you want to make spaces for supporter cards that you don't... Like, you want an excuse to play more supporter cards. And when you have that excuse, cards like Team Flare Grant and Kakui start jumping to mind because... As I mentioned with the Bayonet, you can do 170 really easily on Lele's. If you add Kakui to the mix, that's 190. And 190 is a much nicer number for a lot of different matchups. Obviously, Buzzwall is the most important 190 hit point Pokemon because um, of Buzzrock. But that's already weak to Psychic, so you don't have to worry about that. And then you start looking at the other most important 190 hit point Pokemon. And they're normally actually uh, resistance to Psychic, which is annoying. So Kakui isn't perfect in my opinion. It's really nice sometimes for things like Rayquaza, which is, like, I guess, something you would consider. Um, maybe if you want to cut the Sylveon and just go for a Kakui line, I think it's a lot more risky. Uh, but the Kakui will be better in other matchups as well, so bear that in mind. Flare Grunt could be an additional support against the uh, Lycanroc players again. Biggest downside is we're not playing Countercatcher, so you can't Countercatcher Flare Grunt. You just have to use Flare Grunt on the turn that they use their GX attack and then you've got them. Uh, that's the real hope there, especially like it's more the case against um, Buzz Rocks than Zora Rocks because if it's a Zora Rock, they can just reattach unless you have Flare Grunt E-Hammer in the same turn, which is possible, but if they're annihilating your Zora Rocks, you're drawing a lot less. So Flare Grunt more of a reactive card in this deck than it is in the Zora Lock build because we're not playing uh, Counter Catcher, but still a consideration card in general. And a few item cards. Obviously, I've made the decision that I want to play as many supporters as possible to get this Bayonet up and rolling quickly. Um, but you could think of it more as a tech card, more like a Mew EX, and you just support it a little bit less and go back to things like Max Potion, Evo Soda, Stretcher. These are all really nice cards. Tapu Coco as well. I mentioned that we don't have any spread option, but if you have this Coco spread, you can then be using that Bayonet efficiently every single turn because you're then going to be pinging things around in a much more creative manner. Right now, though, I don't think it's absolutely mandatory, and I think I'd rather play a second Floatstone over the Coco in general. And then getting creative with the energy lines, we've seen how uh, Zoro Garb has played the unit energies to good success, and there is a slight reason for that. We could add Kartana to the mix, adding a cool GX attack option, which is pretty powerful, as well as some metal typing as well, which uh, can go a long way sometimes when there's um, a few metal weak Pokemon out there right now. It can be additional help against things like Sylveon. But if you're playing Guru, it's not a problem. Uh, but yeah, Slice Off being a nice ability again for mirror matches just to have an extra E-Hammer, for example. Or maybe you play this in place of an E-Hammer as well. And uh, there's also the new Celesteela, which is a very good card. If you have exactly six prizes between you and your opponent, uh, you do 160. And we're already playing two choice bands and we're already using that Bayonet ability to get... Um, Lele's in range, we could use this Celesteela on a turn to do a big wipeout uh, uh, for two prizes. And again, it's a really nice, efficient way to deal with stuff. You can pick up that Celesteela quite easily again with things like Acer Rollers that you can be playing, or just force the opponent to Guzma on a turn. And if they're Guzmaring, they're not using N, which is always good for Zorak players because their hand size will be mahusive. And in a similar vein to the unit energy, you could go one step further and play Rainbows. Doing that one damage counter of Rainbow uh, in many cases won't matter because you're going to be using that spread. Once again, you get you attach an energy card, that Rainbow energy does the one, then you throw that one over to the opponent with the Bayonet. Uh, it could be a pretty cool combo. I think the biggest downside is, like I thought about playing it with Baby Buzzwell, and you think, oh cool, the reason why 
you don't always see rainbow baby buzz work in Zoro mirrors is because the rainbow damage puts the buzz wall back in range of a Zoro arc. And if you're using that bayonet, then that's not going to happen. But the problem with that is that you've got a bayonet on your board and bayonet's weak to dark and it gives up two prizes anyway. So um, I think it's not quite perfect to play rainbow, but it could be additional help against Zoro arc. So do bear that in mind. I think it's not perfect. Rainbow could be good in other matchups when you're not against Zoro arc. That sort of defe uh, defeats the point because you're trying to play Rainbow to play things like Baby Buzzwell in the first place. So just my opinion, but I think I can see people getting creative with these energy counts all over again. And I think the Celesteel is actually a really reasonable option and one I want to explore as well. Biggest downside, of course, is that these unit energies get removed and then none of your energy on your board is ever safe. And that's also a scary uh, proposition, so bear that in mind. Matchups are as follows. I think Zoro, Rock is, uh, Zoro Rock is going to be the hardest thing. As I said, the Rock part of the deck is going to be the hardest thing to play around. Just hoping that you can E-Hammer uh, as much as possible is going to be your win condition or dealing with either Rock Ruffs or hit the Lycan Rock before it hits you uh, at least once is going to be important. Um, towards Zoro and Zoro Pod, I think you'll be slightly unfavored. I mean, we are playing 2A Cerola and Delinquent, so there are ways that we can out-resource the opponent, but... At the same time, it's just going to be weird just not being able to use your bayonet, and it also means that your psych energies are kind of dead cards. So I think just the fact that you'll have more dead cards than the opponent makes it kind of bad for you, because it means that you're always attacking with Zoroark, and you're just down to four DCs in that case. And um, it's just going to be harder for you, I think, overall, because Zoropod really indulges in attacking with Glisspod whenever possible, because even if it was to get knocked out on a turn when you miss Max Potion or Acerola or whatever it is, then they at least keep their Zoroark on board and can draw into new stuff. Whereas if our guys go down, it's going to be our draw engine gone and then our board state is just a lot weaker. So I think even though we can sometimes out-resource our right players, and I don't think it's a massive disadvantage, uh, I think we shouldn't expect to win those games. You've got to break Hooper could be awkward, uh, mainly the Hooper. I think that's actually going to be fine, to be honest. We play the Guru and we play the Mr. Mime, so we're not worried about spread devolve. And we're not too worried about the Hooper, but I think you'll often tie that matchup rather than win because essentially you need to have a one one game of 50 minutes where you play very quickly to deck them out, which is a really weird way to try and win the game. Um, but that's going to be how it has to go. You have to play quickly enough for them to deck out naturally um, by using your Oranguru and just getting back Acerola puzzles and then just bouncing this Guru while they try and swing with Hooper every time. I think if they go down a heavy Yveltal break spread route, you've won because of Mr. Mime. So I don't actually think it's a terrible matchup, but I think it's a hard one to win. And if you're looking at Worlds exactly, a tie is as bad as a loss. So bear that in mind. Uh, Zygarde Lycanroc, probably quite awkward for you. We don't have many non-GX attackers uh, and Lycanroc's always an issue. Zoro Weavile, probably awkward again, like the other Zoro builds. Um, we pretty much just can't bench our Weavile's, but at the same, oh sorry, we can't bench our Bayonets, and at the same time we have to limit our Zoroark's, kind of something to bear in mind. Stack Attacker Celesteela, probably difficult, just because, well, the way we have it built, uh, Duskmane Necrozma GX is going to be a big problem. If ever you go ahead in the race against Stack Steela, they can just get B-String turns, do a Sun's Eclipse into a Meteor Tempest, and you're already stuck there. And it's going to be hard for you. I think you can make it hard for them to take their last two prizes, but I think oftentimes they can just burst through you. Uh, so bear that in mind. Zora Shiftry, especially if they get those Shiftries up uh, by using things like Multi-Switch or that new supporter card that can accelerate energy, which I thought was absolutely terrible, but may have synergy with exactly Zora Shiftry, which is funny. Um, but yeah, that feels like a bad matchup just because Shiftry does too much damage and again, one hit stuff. And Zora Mag Cargo. I'm pretty much saying you're unfavored against most Zora stuff, but that may not be exactly true depending on how many heal cards they play. If people are making spaces of the man cargo, they may be cutting down on Ace Rollers and Max Potions. And if that's the case, that's really good for this deck. I think you can win if that's the case. But if they're keeping the spaces for heal and expecting lots of Zoro Mirrors, which I personally would for Worlds, uh, I think you're going to struggle just because you only have 4 DC to work off. Um, if you're ever going to use that Bayonet's GX attack, it's going to come at the cost of two prizes. If you're going to use that Bayonet uh, ben to finish off a Lele, that's kind of fine, I guess. It kind of reminds you of using a GX attack with a Glycopod in many respects, but uh, the Glycopod normally stays on the board, whereas the uh, Bayonet is definitely going to go down afterwards. So it feels a little bit YOLO in Mirror, so bear that in mind. Other than that, your Azora deck, you're going to be pretty reasonable and you'll be pretty strong. Here are the closing thoughts. 
Bennett definitely does help the Buswell matchup. You can't really deny that. I think the biggest thing to worry about is that it may not be as helpful as Mew in exactly Buzzrock. My concern lies with the fact that you need to have a lot of supporters in your discard pile early. And the way you typically use Mew EX, although you can use it late after they've B-stringed to a GX, typically you want the Mew EX to be attacking turn two and knocking out their baby buzzes uh, while B-string isn't live and while they aren't doing too much damage to you. Um, and if your Bayonet, basically to get the Bayonet working for a one hit KO, you basically need to have like two Zoroarks up, Lely into Sycamore and then Sycamore away stuff and then have enough um, supports in your discard pile and hit Psych Energy and a Bayonet. That's a lot to ask for, to be honest. I think it's a lot more to ask for than it is to get a Mew DCE copying Riders beating. So it may be... Basically, you have to navigate the matchup differently to current Zorak decks. Maybe I'm just finding it hard to picture. Uh, but the fact that the Bayonet is much tankier means it's going to be a bigger problem for the opponent. They're really incentivized to get those Rockcrofts down and secure them with energy attachments. And hopefully Zorak decks, especially with us playing for Guzma, we should be able to punish that fairly reasonably. Um, so I think the matchup will be reasonable. I just don't know if it'll be better than just using Mew EXs. But... Other than the fact that it may not be as efficient as the Mew EX, I think it's solid. I think its ability is really good for setting up math. Um, and I think if you're not using it in Mirror, if you have enough heal cards inherently, you may still be fine. We're playing Guru, as I said, so we're playing Delinquent as well. So I think we have outs to Mirror, even if you're not specifically using the, uh, the Bayonet itself. So... Let me know what you guys think about this deck. Oh, final point is that I think most Zoro decks going into Worlds probably do need to fit in Mr. Mime and Sylveon if they don't already have good answers to those cards, like with extra healing cards or additional ways to get one-hit KOs if it's not using the Sylveon EX DCE combo. <coughs> so that's my two cents on Zoro Bennett. It's one I really want to test out. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to play. Uh, very creative as well, putting these damage counters on the board and uh insightful and clever ways to try and get one hit goes maybe way later down the line could be very interesting and using that gx attack is gonna have great nostalgia compared to that uh decidui that i used to play a lot as well uh, especially in combination with things like n it can be super potent for zorak decks to go n i have three puzzles next turn what are you gonna do about it i think that's just a really cool statement that you can make with this deck so definitely a lot of fun let me know what you guys think about bayonet and zoro itself let me know what you think about my tech cards and my supporter decisions. Do I need to play more? Do I need to play less? Do I need to go all out on Sycamores? Let me know what you think down below and I'll be sure to get back to you. Uh, on to the Ultra Beast stuff next, I think. Uh, we're going to be doing some Stacker Attacker builds. Me and Jack have been testing uh, Stacker Steeler as well as Stacker Naganadel. So I'm going to be trying to bring you that soon as well. And it's ended up a lot more creative and different than I thought it would. Uh, so some interesting results there so far. That's it though guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in another video soon. Cheers.